Hey, it's been awesome. Today's going to be great. Would you join me up on your feet? I'm excited to preach to you today. I've only preached once in about the last eight weeks. Maybe that's why we had revival. I don't know. Y'all tell me after today. Uh, but I'm excited to finish the book of James. And I know some of y'all are like, finish it already. You've been preaching this since April. But I'm having fun. So I, w- I want to say a couple of things in the way of just kind of introduction. We are, we've just come through this really powerful summer series, but I'm believing it's just the beginning of what God's doing for the rest of the year here at Champions. And uh, about two weeks ago, I was thinking, all right, you got to get ready to get back into James 5. And, you know, James 5 is famous for scriptures about prayer and uh, call the elders of the church. The effectual fervent prayers of the righteous avail much. I'm like, all right, man, this is revival continues. So I opened up to James 5, 1, and I read it, and I thought, can we skip this one? (laughs) And you'll know why as we read together. James 5, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Now listen. Somebody say, listen. Listen. You rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Somebody say, revival. Revival. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You see why I wanted to skip it. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. Let's pray. Lord, we stand on your word. We love your word. We need your word. I pray, Lord, that you would help me communicate your word with heart, with clarity today, so that we walk out of here better because of time together, time in your presence, and time in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say, amen. You may be seated. You know, the, the thing I love about preaching preaching right through a book of the Bible, is that I don't have to come up with anything for the next week. Uh, The challenge of preaching right through a book of the Bible is I preach whatever comes up. And this week, James, James gives us a relatively challenging passage, but that I think will be good, good for us today. And I, I still think you'll leave encouraged. So just as a reminder, James is writing to believers. He's writing a book about spiritual maturity. And we have throughout this series defined spiritual maturity as becoming more like Jesus. That is God's plan for you personally, Romans 8 tells us, is to make you more like Jesus. And so these believers that James is writing to They have faced persecution. They are scattered outside of Jerusalem because of persecution. And in the fire of that persecution, I think James is seeing immaturity arise in the church amongst believers. And so he writes this book as a call to become more like Jesus even in the face of persecution. And In this area, he's calling us to maturity in the way of our money, in the way of our possessions. He's calling us to be more like Jesus in the way that we handle and the way we view our finances. Here's what Paul said about Jesus in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The call is to become more like him, right? That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, 
so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Somebody say, amen. Amen. You know, if you read the book of Acts, uh, they're they're an incredible revival. 3,000 added on the first day and, and, and many more thousands added over the days, weeks, months after the day of Pentecost. And one of the hallmarks of that revival season was that people gave extravagantly. I genuinely believe that supernatural giving accompanies supernatural revival. Why? Because when we are revived, we are revived with an attitude that says, I want to be more like Jesus. And Jesus, more than anybody else, is an example of trading in what he had for the benefit of other people. Is anybody in the room with me? And so James calls us to maturity, and he calls us to maturity by condemning either a real person or a hypothetical person who got it wrong. And that's what we read in James 5, 1 through 6. And so let's revisit these verses. Now, listen, you rich people, weep and wail. Somebody say, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. All right, let's let's take a moment, step back. I, I need you to know that this is not a blanket condemnation of people who are rich. We live in a day and age that tends to wanna condemn people who are rich because the assumption is that if they have more, then they must have taken advantage of people who have less. And certainly that's the case sometimes, but it's not always the case, and as believers, we shouldn't assume so. And so James isn't making a blanket condemnation of the rich like so many in our society today do. The Bible is not against the rich. And just as as an aside, if you want to understand the Bible, you have to let the Bible help you interpret itself. And we see, if you read the Bible just a little bit, that God is not anti-rich, right? Some of our heroes of the faith were incredibly rich. You think about Job. He was one of the most wealthy people in all of the Old Testament. You think about Abraham, him and his nephew. They got so wealthy, they couldn't even live in the same city. It was just, they had too much. You think about David. You think about Solomon, and it was Solomon who said, and it made it in your Bible, that the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And so the Bible doesn't, clearly doesn't show that God is anti-rich. As a matter of fact, God has all throughout history and even to the modern day used people of great means to advance the kingdom in a significant way. I mean, heck, I'm believing some of y'all, the blessing of the Lord is going to make you rich and that you're going to show up with a $10,000, $25,000, $50,000, $100,000 tithe and say, hey, God's been good to me. Come on, does anybody want that? Don't think about where you are. Think about what God could do in your life. God is not anti you succeeding or me succeeding because... People who have a heart for God and a heart for the kingdom of God, that God is blessed with great wealth, have an opportunity to advance the kingdom in a significant way. And I'm not ashamed to say I'm praying in half a million dollar gifts. I'm praying in million dollar gifts, two million dollar gifts. Hey, come on somebody. And I'm praying in just more givers like me who tithe and give faithfully every week. It all matters. And I guess what I'm wanting to say is God doesn't prefer one person over the other, whether the rich or the poor. And and I say all that because we tend to hear a message like this and we think, oh, it's for somebody else because I'm not rich. It's for, some, it's for that person over there. I, I see what they drive. They, they need to be listening. In reality, the, the, the issue is not whether or not we have it. It's whether or not it has us. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money, 
often misquoted, right? Money is not the root of evil. It's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. It says some people eager for money. Who would that be? That's people that may not have it now, but they really want it real bad. Have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And, and so the message is for all of us to, to maybe step back and evaluate our relationship with finances and our relationship with possessions because we can, I heard a quote this week by a person named J.C. Ryle. He said, it's possible to love money and not have it, and it's possible to have money but not love it. And so it really is to all of us that James, right, and I want to give you one big idea and then tease it out. Here's the big idea for today. God cares about your money. When you got saved, your money got saved too. As God is working to sanctify you, he's working to sanctify your finances as well. And he cares about how you get it. He cares about what you do with it. And he cares about how you view it. And Brian did a great job talking about tithing and giving. That's not my focus today. My focus is really just our relationship with money and whether or not it is God honoring. So I wanna give you three realities that I see in this passage and give you three responses that I think we should take away. First reality is that God cares about how you get what you have. God cares about how you get what you have. James 5, 1 and 4, he says, now listen you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Verse. Four, look, the wages you failed to pay, the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. James is talking about a person who has much, but they have much because they've taken advantage of people with less. They've, they, they've, they've lived a life without integrity. They have made their living by 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 robbing people, dragging people into court, suing people, taking advantage of people, hurting people, not being fair with people, not dealing straight with people. This is a person who has much, but they have uh, hooked and crooked to get it. You know what I'm saying? This is a person with zero integrity. And he tells us, people go out there on your fields and they do work for you. They bring in your harvest, what you're going to sell to make money, and yet you don't turn around and pay them what they're owed. And the reality is, in this day, they had no recourse. What are you going to do if you're abject poor? You're not going to drag the rich man into court because even today, if a rich person goes to court and a poor person goes to court, the person with the better lawyer wins. And so they had no recourse. They went out and did a day's work for a day's wages and yet weren't paid. They couldn't go drag this person into court. They'd waste more money than what they were owed. And so their only only path forward was to cry out to God. And James tells us that God hears their cries. And so God cares about how you get what you have. What's our response to that reality? Well, we should, as believers especially, we should value integrity in all that we do and in all that we pursue. We should make, we should be fair with people. We should pay people what they're owed. We should deliver on time. We should deliver what people pay us for. We should show up on time, not be a time thief. Come on, somebody. We should show up on time, work hard when we're on the clock, don't leave early, don't quiet quit until five. Are y'all all all right? I know I'm right there in your cubicle, but just lighten up everybody. I want us to be good believers everywhere we go. We're not just a good Christian because we come to church and know the songs on Sunday. No, I live my faith out as I live with integrity Monday through Saturday as well. God cares about how you get what you have. This building is not the only sanctified space in your life, but as a believer, you should treat every space that you walk into as sacred and sanctified and treat it with dignity, right? So we wanna be fair with people. We wanna shoot straight with people. 
Let our yes be yes and let our no be no. That customers or contractors don't have to gripe about those Christians that talk about how blessed they are but don't come through when it's time to pay or deliver. And if you're that way, stop saying you're blessed and highly favored. You're making God look bad. <laughs> Just say, I'm good. <laughs> so God cares about your money. He, he cares about how you get what you have. Second reality. God cares about what you do with what you have. And well, I, well, I got it. It's mine to do what I, what I want to do with it. Not, not quite so fast, James 5, 2 through 3. He says, your wealth is rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. I want you to see here, the problem is the hoarding, not the having. The problem is the hoarding, not the having, I, I read this and I think about Scrooge McDuck. Come on, any 80s babies in the room? Y'all remember Scrooge? He'd get up in the morning, walk into that room with all the coins, take off his robe, and just dive into all his money. Swim around in his gold for a little while and then hop out and go about his day. The problem is, is the hoarding, not the having. And so, Here's the scenario with this either real person that James has in mind or hypothetical person. The, the problem is that this person has more than they can ever use, and yet they would rather it rot and corrode and go to ruin than help other people with it. You see, the, the problem there is not that they have more than others. God, it's the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. God is not anti-wealth, but there is this terrible picture of starving people, indigent people. And you got to remember, in this society, I was going to go down a rabbit trail, but in this society at this time, there were no middle class. There weren't an 80% of the working class. There were rich people and poor people. And so there were starving people out on the steps in front of this rich man's palace, and yet they would waste their food at the end of the night instead of help these folks. And so there's this picture of extravagant wealth that no single person or family could ever use up against people who could just really use the crumbs, like one person said to Jesus, that fell off of their table. But instead of helping those that they could, they would rather it rot and ruin and corrode and go to waste. And what James says is that's your prerogative, but the problem is when you live that way, not only does the wealth corrode, but your character corrodes as well. I think it was Jesus himself that said, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world, to have more than you could ever use or spend or do anything with, and yet you lose your soul to this type of corrosion that James talks about in verse number three. I want to take just a moment and talk about good stewardship. Somebody say stewardship. Stewardship is management. I think the right view of your money is that God is the owner, I'm the manager, I'm the the steward. Good stewardship honors God. And can I just tell you that saving money is a part of good stewardship. So, so again, you can take these verses to the extreme. You can become anti-wealth, anti-saving. There are people that think it's spiritual to just live by the seat of their pants because we don't want to hoard up. Hey, the problem is not the having, it's the hoarding. But saving and hoarding are not the same thing. If God has blessed you, he will bless you more if you manage what he's given you now well. Come on. He who is faithful with a little will be given much. Can we talk about Jesus? 
And I've preached that verse for about 25 years and the, and the context in my mind has always been, well, if I'm faithful to give, then God will give me more. And he will, but it's, it doesn't say he who is faithful to give. He says he who is faithful. He who manages what they have well, even if it's a little, puts themselves in a position before God to be blessed by God with more. And so please don't walk out hearing me say that saving is bad or planning is bad. No, no, no. Those things honor God and put you in a position to be blessed by God with greater. And you don't need a lot to be a good steward. You can manage or mismanage one dollar. If all you have is one dollar and you save 10% or you tithe 10%, you save 10% and then you live on the other 80%, you've managed it well. But if you have one dollar and you spend a dollar 25, come on somebody. You don't, you don't need to be rich to be a good manager. In fact, God wants to see how do you manage the dollar. And saving is a part of good management. But can I tell you, so is giving. And we tend to, we tend to fall, well, I, you know, I gotta, I gotta, no, 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 I, I can't do that. I gotta, I gotta be, I gotta, I gotta. And that's when we switch from managing to hoarding from stewarding to hoarding. When because of good planning, we can give and yet we don't. We can be generous and yet we are not. And so the condemnation comes for this person when we consider the good that could have been done but was not done. The help that could have been offered but was not offered the ministry that could have been presented but was not presented not because they managed well in fact they didn't manage what they had well they went from stewarding to hoarding and so what's our response to this reality well we should manage our money well and prioritize generosity it's not one or the other it's both Heard somebody preach a message one time called dumb dichotomies. You ever heard of a dichotomy? It's like when you, two opposing things. Well, sometimes we put things at odds that shouldn't be at odds. You can be a good manager and a very generous person. As a matter of fact, if you manage your dollar well, you'll find you have more than you thought you had when you weren't managing it well. Same goes with your time and your energy and and everything else that when you are a good steward of what God has given you, you will find immediately that you have more than you thought you had. And when God sees they manage the little well, I can bless them with more. Come on, Solomon. It's the blessing of the Lord that makes one rich. Why wouldn't God give seed to somebody who manages their seed well and sows seed? Somebody look at your neighbor and say, revival! And, and I, I believe this. I believe that generosity is a hallmark of revival. It, it is an outgrowth of revival. That when we have the right view of our money and possessions, that God blesses us in a greater way. Hey, Genesis 12, God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. See, God will get it, I heard somebody say, God will get it to you if God can get it through you. If you recognize that God cares about what I do with what I have and that God is blessing me so that I can bless others, then God will make sure that you have room to bless others. Third reality. God cares about how you view what you have. So God cares about how you get what you have. He cares about what you do with what you have. But God, it's not just about the getting and the doing. You you know, it's like uh, when you're, I was gonna say your husband or your wife, but it's a wife thing. It's like when your wife says, no, no, I want you to, I want you to want to do it. Like, I don't wanna do it, I'll do it, but I don't wanna do that. It's like, no, 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 I want you to want to. No, I I don't want to. 
but I will. God doesn't just care about how you get it and what you do. He wants you to have the right view of it. He wants you to have the right relationship with your money and with your possessions. He cares about how you view what you have, verses five and six. You have lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Here's what we see happening. We see a comparison. We have this comparison between self-indulgence on one part and indigence out there on the street in front of the palace. We see this comparison between one who fattens themselves because they, because they have more than they could ever use or need or ever make actual use of while others go hungry and are cold. And what James says, and it's a hard thing to say, is that, that this kind of selfishness is literally a death sentence for others. And yet this person in the palace is so blissfully ignorant that they don't see it. They don't, they don't understand it. Why? It speaks to their view of their possessions, their, their relationship with what they have. And I, I guess my question is, how do you view what you have? God cares about how you view what you have. Do you love it or do you love God with it? Because you can love it and not even have it. Or you can have it and not even love it. Is it the work of your hand or is it the work of God in your life? See, if I view it as the work of my hand, then, then I, am, I am the captain of that check. And whatever I say goes and anybody can think what they want, but I'm gonna do what I want. But when I recognize that every, every good and perfect gift comes from God, that it is God that allowed me to do what I do to make a living, that it is God who didn't just create me but is still right now giving me every breath, that it is God who put the know-how in my brain, that it is God who put the energy in my body, that it is God who allows me to do whatever I do, that it is God that allowed me to meet those people and find that favor, and that they saw my resume and the stack of other resumes. When I recognize that everything one way or another comes from God, then I realize that God holds me accountable to how I view what he's given me. And not just how I view it, but how I use it. So he, 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 he has an expectation on it that I manage it well, that I get it in a, in, a, in a way with lots of integrity, that I bless others, that I build his kingdom. What's your view of it? Is it yours or is it God's in your hand? Are you the owner or are you the manager? The view matters. Because one way will make you fall in love with it, the other way will keep you in love with God even as you use it. And so what's our response? We, we should view money as God's tool in our hand, not as our treasure in our chest. But God has blessed you to be a blessing that if you're faithful with a little, God will give you much. And he gives you much so that through you, he can make a difference in the lives of other people. That, that when I collect my check, that God, this is a tool in my hand. It's a tool to feed my family and to take care of our needs. It's a tool to save some so that we have security. It's a tool to tithe and to give, to fortify, strengthen, build, and advance your kingdom. And it's also a tool to meet needs of people all around me. And because God cares, he cares about how you get it, cares about what you do with it, cares about how you view it, because he cares, he will hold us accountable. Y'all are quiet. I'm trying to smile. I'm not mad. I'm <laughs> preaching James 5, 1 through 6. But I want you to see all over these verses, there's, 
There's courtroom language. Well, look at this in verses 3 and 4. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will what testify against you. It will testify against you. So the waste, right? The ministry that wasn't done that should have been done. The help that should have been offered that wasn't offered. Th- that, that corrosion, that ruin, that waste, that excess that went to nothing will testify against you. Uh, but also the wages you failed to pay the workers, the wages themselves, the, the, the corners that you cut, the people that you did wrong, the, the, what they were owed will testify against you. And not just them, but the cries of those that were taken advantage of. Come on, when you don't have recourse against somebody that has more and does more, when people around the world have nothing but to cry out to God, their cries will testify either for us or against us. There's courtroom language all over this, and we remember that ultimately we all will stand before God one day, and we will give an account for every word and every deed, all that we did and all that we did not do. And you say, Chase, this is a... It's a heavy message. It's a heavy way to end. And I don't intend for it to be. I really don't. I'm just trying to preach the Bible. But you have to remember that we are all on the clock. I remember in 2010, I went to New York City for the first time. And uh, I booked a hotel on Priceline. Come on, somebody. And they used to do that thing where you could name your own price and you'd get a random hotel. So I named my own price and I, I wound up in a hotel in downtown. Well, I thought, all right, I made it. I didn't know downtown was so far away from all the other stuff. So I get there, I get checked into my hotel and it's late at night because I was flying standby. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so on the last flight out of town, got there at about midnight, got in my hotel and I thought, I need something to eat. And so I went out to go find food, and they say it's a city that never sleeps, not in downtown. (laughs) They was asleep. And I remember it was probably one in the morning, first time ever there, and I'm just looking for food. Pizza places in the hotel, they had pizza. They were all closed. I'm like, my goodness, what? So I'm out walking around, and I walked by a cemetery. And I was like, oh, that's cool. It looks old. And I, I kind of peer through. This, I'm, I'm in town for 30 minutes at this point. I peer through the wrought iron fence, and I see a big giant grave, Alexander Hamilton. It's before he was famous again, right? This was, and I thought, oh, man. And, and it was the, the kind of the famous Trinity Church graveyard where all these famous people were buried. You know, they don't put cemeteries by churches anymore. And I understand why. But I think there's a benefit to walking by the cemetery on your way to church. Because I think it could be a good reminder that we're all on the clock. That every one of us, we are going to stand before God one day. And, And on that day, that day, what will not matter is how much we had or how much we hoarded, what will matter is what we did or didn't do with it. God cares, God cares, and he cares so much that he's gonna ask us one day, what'd you do with what I gave you? And so this isn't about tithing, it it isn't about giving, although you should do those things. You should build the kingdom. You should advance the kingdom. But this is the foundation of why you do those things, that God is the owner. I'm the manager, that everything he gives me is his tool in my hand, and I want to manage it well so that I can make the greatest difference in the world around me in the time that I have because we are all on the clock. One day I'll stand before him and I will give a full account. But right now, while I'm still breathing earth's air and while I'm still walking on earth's earth, I have the opportunity to do something for God in the church and in the lives of people around me and in the lives of people all over the world. 
that God has right now given me the opportunity. Every dollar I get is an opportunity to make a difference for the kingdom and make a difference on the table of people around me. That our community should be better because we're here. Not just because the church is here, but because believers are here who are generous and who make a difference and who love people and who serve people and who help meet needs and aren't blissfully oblivious to the hurt and the pain in the world around us. Our world should be better because we're here. We see the news and we want God to change it. We want God to fix it. We see the commercials of abject poverty and indigence around our nation and in our cities and around the world. And we say, God, do something about this. And God says, I have put billions into the hands of believers. Do something with it. Don't hoard it. Share it. Make a difference. Come on, somebody. This isn't about you giving more to the church. This is about you understanding that God has given me the opportunity to make a difference in the world around me, and I am on the clock. It's an opportunity, but can I tell you, the opportunity is also an obligation. Because if it all comes from him, he's got expectations for it. Would you stand with me? I'd like to do something that's not all together foreign for me, but haven't done it in a while. Kind of had the feeling y'all wouldn't be running around the room I told my wife, I'm going to have to make sure I smile a whole lot. But what I'd like to do as we close is I just want to read several verses from Philippians to you. And, and I just want to ask you, if you would, to, to close your eyes. So I just want to read it over you. Remember, this is a call to Maturity. It's a call of maturity in a very specific area. We have to get this right. And so Paul writes, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mind as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.